Hi, I'm Pastor Cheryl Pickford. Thank you so much for joining me today for this message titled, Death, Where is Your Sting? Now, my husband and I are brand new official residents of the great state of Florida now. And as a result of this legal change, we started discussing the long list of things that we need to do as we transition from a Virginia residency to living in the Sunshine State. One of the things is updating our wills, particularly the living will part of this legal document. Now, gotta say, I don't particularly enjoy talking about my or my husband's death. I mean, we know it will happen someday, barring being raptured by the Lord, and hopefully many, many years from now, but no one knows how long the Lord will give us here on earth. People die every day from car accidents, illness, or natural causes. It's a part of life, becoming more and more clear as we grow older. You know, we do what we can to delay the inevitable. We exercise, we eat right, and we try to implement our doctor's suggestions to extend our physical health. But I think most of us would like more time with our loved ones. Time to complete our task and time to enjoy God's handiwork. Yet, the finality of this life lurks in the shadows. And activities like updating one's will just reminds us that the end, while not necessarily near, is approaching. <laughs> so on that cheery note, I'm going to talk about death today. Namely, why do we have to deal with death? The antidote to death and the eternal life that we can have through Jesus Christ. Before we launch into this message, please join me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you are such a good God, and I thank you that you care about all the cares that we have. Lord, this is a not a happy subject, dealing with death. It touches all of us in one way or another, and is part of life. But Father, I pray that this message that you gave me will encourage people, will point them more to you, bring them into your kingdom, Lord, if they don't know you already, and bring them into that wonderful eternal life that you have given us through Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I pray that you would anoint my words, anoint the ears of those who are hearing this message today, and we give you all honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, number one, would our first point would be, why do we have to deal with death? You know, we weren't designed for death. In the beginning, mankind was created without sin and lived in perfect harmony with God in Eden. Adam and Eve regularly walked with God, and they had a close, personal relationship with Him. Now, God told them, you can eat from any tree in the garden except for one the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But did you know included in the garden was the tree of everlasting life? God didn't place a ban on that one. And I imagine God was waiting for Adam and Eve to eat from that particular tree and was joyfully looking forward to being able to celebrate immortality with his people. But we know the rest of the story. Eve was deceived by Satan, and Adam and Eve sinned against God. And as a result, they were banished from the garden, and angels were placed around the tree of everlasting life, lest Adam and Eve eat its fruit in their sinful state. With their sin, death entered the world. And since then, we have all been born into Adam's physical family, the family that leads to certain death. All of us have reaped the rewards of Adam's sin. We've inherited his guilt, a sinful nature which provides our tendency to sin, and God's punishment. The Bible tells us that we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Consequently, hell is our default destination setting. Now, death is the result of Adam's sin and the sins that we all commit, even if they don't resemble Adam's sin. 
Paul reminds us in Romans that for thousands of years people died before the law that of God had been given. And then God gave Moses the law to help people see their sinfulness, to show the seriousness of their offenses and to drive them back to God for mercy and pardon. Romans chapter 5, 20 through 21 reads, But the law, this is the law of Moses, came to increase and expand the awareness of the trespass by defining and unmasking sin. But where sin increased, God's remarkable, gracious gift of grace, his unmerited favor, has surpassed it and increased all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, so also grace would reign through righteousness, which brings eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin is a deep rupture between who we are and who we were created to be. The law points out our sin and places the responsibility for our sin squarely on our shoulders. The law offers no remedy at all for sin. But God, God has provided an antidote for our sin through Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus, we can trade God's judgment for forgiveness. We can trade our sin for Jesus' goodness. Christ offers us the opportunity to be born into his spiritual family. This family line, unlike Adam's, that begins with sin and ends with death, this family line begins with forgiveness and leads to eternal life. Now, our physical bodies will wear out and break down. These physical bodies are fragile. They're subject to the laws of this broken, sin-soaked world. And despite the advances in modern science, people still experience physical death. God has given us all the gift of free choice. We can choose to do nothing and have spiritual death through Adam. Or we can choose to come to Christ by faith and have eternal life. Which family do you want to belong to? Now we've seen that everyone has to deal with death thanks to Adam's sin. Now we're going to take a look at God's antidote. The antidote to death, of course, is Jesus Christ. Look at Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Death cast a frightening shadow over us because we're helpless in its presence. We can struggle with other enemies, such as pain, suffering, disease, or injury, but strength and courage cannot overcome death. It has the final word. Only one person can walk with us through death's dark valley and bring us safely to the other side. That person is Jesus Christ. He is our Good Shepherd who offers us eternal comfort. Now a few years ago, I was hospitalized with chest pains. I thought I might be having a heart attack and was placed and was admitted to the hospital for observation turns out it wasn't my heart, but a deeply embedded kidney infection that was causing the chest pain. But during that night in the hospital, I underwent intense spiritual attack, and I clung to this verse. Yes, the hospital was the valley of the shadow of death, but it was not my death. Jesus was with me through the long night as I battled. The enemy of my soul wanted me to agree with his lies and surrender to death. I was seriously ill and probably could have succumbed to the temptation. Now, a few weeks ago, I was again diagnosed with another serious urinary tract infection. And again, the enemy whispered to me, this is what will kill you. Well, not today, Satan. This is only the valley of the shadow of death. And because our physical life is uncertain, we should follow Jesus, our Good Shepherd, who offers eternal comfort and eternal spiritual life. 
Hebrews 9, 27 through 28 reads, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Death is unavoidable. So we should be prepared. You know, we prepare for other things like hurricanes and blizzards, but many people fail to prepare for death. All people will one day die physically, but Christ died so that we would not have to die spiritually. We can have confidence in his saving work for us past, present, and future. He's forgiven our past sin. When he died on that cross, he sacrificed himself once and for all. He has given us the Holy Spirit to help us deal with present temptations and sin. He appears for us now in heaven as our high priest, and he promises to return and raise us to eternal life in a world where sin will be banished. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 55 says, and when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and this mortal puts on immortality, then the scripture will be fulfilled that says, death is swallowed up in victory. That means it's vanquished forever. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin by which it brings death is the law. Now Satan seemed to be victorious in the Garden of Eden when Jesus died on the cross. But God turned Satan's apparent victory into defeat when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Death no longer needs to be a source of dread or fear. Christ overcame it, and one day we will too. Death has been defeated, and we have hope beyond the grave. Now, none of this would have been possible if Jesus had not gone to the cross and risen from the dead. He willingly gave his life to free us from the bondage of sin. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 reads, Your attitude must be like my own, for I, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. A ransom, you see, was the price paid for the release of a slave from bondage. Jesus often told his disciples that he must die. But here, here he told them why he must die. He died to redeem all people from the bondage of sin and death. His death not only saved the disciples, but everyone in the world who chooses to trust him for their salvation. John chapter 12 verses 23 and 24 reads, Jesus replied that the time had come for him to return to his glory in heaven, and said, and that, and he said, I must fall and die like a kernel of wheat that falls into the furrows of the earth. Unless I die, I will be alone, a single seed. But my death will produce many new wheat kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. See, Jesus had to die not only to pay for our sins, but also to show his power over death. His resurrection proves that he has eternal life. Because Jesus is God, he can give this same eternal life to all who believes in him. His death and resurrection give us hope. Now, many Jews considered the good news of Jesus Christ to be foolishness because they thought the Messiah would be a conquering warrior accompanied by many signs and miracles. Jesus had not restored David's throne as they expected, and he was executed as a criminal. They couldn't believe a Messiah would choose to die that way. Greeks also considered the gospel foolish. They didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. They didn't see in Jesus the powerful characteristics of their mythological gods, and they thought no reputable person would ever be crucified. To them, death was a defeat instead of a victory. 
While the good news of Jesus Christ still sounds like foolishness to many, our society today worships power and influence and wealth. Jesus came as a humble, poor, poor servant, and he offers his kingdom to those who's with faith, not works. This looks like foolishness to the world, but Christ is our power and the only way that we can be saved. Knowing Christ personally is the greatest wisdom that anyone can have. So we've seen that everyone has to deal with death thanks to Adam's sin. We've looked at God's antidote to our sin problem, namely Jesus Christ. Now we're going to take a look at the eternal life that we can have through Jesus Christ. We can have eternal life through Jesus. Now what will this eternal life be like? The prophet Isaiah tells us that there will be peace and confident trust forever. Can you imagine a life of complete peace? Now we can only achieve true peace when God's Spirit is among us. We can have God's Spirit with us now, for He's available to all believers through Jesus Christ. Jesus assured his disciples that he wouldn't leave them orphans, that he would send a comforter or a helper who would never leave them. This is the Holy Spirit. John 15:26 says, When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. If you're a believer, trusting Jesus for your salvation, the Holy Spirit is with you now. Listen to John 3.16. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten Son, so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now some people have such awful lives that the thought of an eternal life is repugnant to them. But eternal life is not an extension of a person's miserable mortal life. Eternal life is God's life, embodied in Christ, and given to all believers now as a guarantee that they will live forever. In eternal life, there is no death. There's no sickness, no enemy, no evil or sin. And when we don't know Christ, we make choices as though this life is all we have. But in reality, this life is just a stepping stone to eternity. When you receive this new life by faith in Christ, you begin to evaluate everything that happens through an eternal perspective. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul explains how the Spirit transforms believers so they are now conformed to the image of Jesus. He now clarifies that this change means Believers embody Jesus' death through suffering and participate in his present risen life. This life is ultimately experienced through the resurrection of the body in the future. But it also consists of an inward renewal in the midst of the challenges and troubles of our daily existence. Our hope is therefore not a release from our bodies, but a resurrection of our bodies so that the life inside us now will show outside as well. While we still suffer, this hope of bodily resurrection is a matter of faith. Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth. We know that if our earthly house, a mere tent that can easily be taken down, is destroyed, we will then live in an, in an eternal home in the heavens a building crafted by divine, not human, hands. Paul states that our present bodies make us groan, but when we die, we won't be spirits without bodies. We will have new bodies that will be perfect for our everlasting life. Now the church in Corinth was at the heart of Greek culture, and many believers had difficulty with this concept of body res bodily resurrection. The Greeks did not believe in a bodily resurrection. Most believed that the real person was the soul, imprisoned in a physical body, and that the afterlife was something that happened only to the soul. They believed that the soul was released at death, 
but there was no immortality for the body. But the Bible teaches that the body and soul are inseparable. We won't be floating around like a disembodied ghost, but we'll have new bodies that are perfectly suited for our eternal life. Eternal life is ours when we know God. How do we get eternal life? Jesus tells us in John 17, 3, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We gain eternal life when we enter into a personal relationship with God in Jesus Christ. When we admit our sin and turn away from it, Christ's love lives in us by the Holy Spirit. Now our world is filled with many philosophers and self-styled authorities who say that they can help you find eternal life, but only Jesus has the true words of eternal life. People look everywhere for eternal life and miss Jesus Christ, who is the only true source. Now, here's a really cool thing. Eternal life is not something that you can earn. It's a free gift which you receive when you trust in Jesus. Whoever believes in God's Son and trusts in Him for their salvation has eternal life. And you don't need to wait to receive it. Eternal life is yours the moment that you believe. You don't need to worry about it because you've already been given eternal life by God himself. It's guaranteed. Now, sadly, some people only hope that they will receive eternal life. John says we can know that we have it. Listen to 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Our certainty of eternal life is based on God's promise that he has given us eternal life through his Son, Jesus Christ. This is true whether you feel close to God or distant from Him. Eternal life is not based on feelings, but on facts. You can know that you have eternal life if you believe God's truth. So we've seen that everyone has to deal with death, thanks to Adam's sin. We've looked at God's antidote to our sin problem, namely Jesus Christ. And we see that we can have eternal life when we trust Jesus Christ for our salvation. So let me ask, where are you right now? Are you certain that you have eternal life? Or are you only hoping that maybe someday you'll have it? If you aren't sure that you're a Christian, ask yourself, have I honestly committed my life to Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Honestly committing your life is more than knowing that Jesus is the baby in the manger on your Christmas card. Honestly committing means obedience to Christ. Do you believe that Jesus paid for your salvation? If you can't say yes to these questions, what is stopping you from taking that step right now? Just talk to Jesus in prayer. Tell him that you're sorry for your sins. Ask him to help you avoid sinning and help you live your life for him. Ask him to save you and be Lord of your life. This is a prayer that he always, always hears. And then tell someone. The Bible tells us in Romans 10:8. For salvation that comes from trusting Christ, which is what we preach, is already within easy reach of each of us. In fact, it is as near as our own hearts and mouths. For if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in his heart that a man becomes right with God. And with his mouth, he tells others of his faith, confirming his salvation. 
when you know by faith that you are indeed a child of God, you have eternal life. We no longer need to fear physical death because God's already prepared a place for us. We will receive new bodies that will never be sick or die. And we will live with God forever. All praise, honor, and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ, who died to make this possible for us. Well, my friends, I thank you for joining me for this message today. Please feel free to share it on your social media. And I pray that the Lord will continue to bless you greatly until we meet again.